Welcome to The Road Show. I'm Karen Jensen Salisbury, your host for today. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you're ready for a great road show today because on the show we have Dr. R.T. Kendall. Dr. Kendall, welcome back to The Road Show. I'm glad to be with you. You can call me R.T. if you like. Okay. It's up to you. All right, we will do. Listeners, here's a little bit of background about R.T. Kendall. He was born in Ashland, Kentucky. He got his Master of Divinity at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary and his Ph.D. at Oxford University. Then he was the pastor of Westminster Chapel in London, England for 25 years. Um, R.T., you and I haven't talked since 2018 when I interviewed you about your book, Popular in Heaven, Famous in Hell. And today I want to talk about your book called Fear, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. But you've written quite a few other books since then. One of the books that you've written really intrigued me the title of was called For an Audience of One. What's that one about? Well, it's from John 5.44. The reason that the Jews missed their Messiah was because uh, they cared more about what others think than what God thought. Uh And Jesus said in John 5, 44, how can you believe who receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that comes from the only God? And for that reason, they missed their Messiah. And uh, it was said of Billy Graham, and I think it's true, uh, that uh, when he preached, He preached to an audience of one. He preached for God. And uh, so I I said we should do everything as if only God were watching and we wanted to please him. So that's the idea of that particular book. That is great. You've written so many books. Do you have a favorite? Uh, Are you a mother? Yes. Do you have a favorite child? <laughs> no. <laughs> I get it. That's the problem. Yes. I, I, they're all, you know, when I finish a book, you could call this a strength, you could call it a weakness. When I finish a book, I say, this is the best book I've written yet. <laughs> In fact, I just, uh, well, we won't go to, I'm writing two books at the moment. Wow. And, uh. I'm 87 years old, and I guess publishers want to get all they can out of me before I go to heaven. Wow. And I know you travel, too. So besides writing, what are you doing with your days these days? Well, let's see. Uh, Last week I was in Los Angeles preaching for a Korean church. Uh, I go once a month to Times Square Church in New York City. And uh, uh, now that COVID is... uh, diminishing. I'm beginning to get invitations around the world. I was in London last week, go to Hong Kong for Easter. And um, so I'm happy that I'm in good health and managed to do everything I was doing 21 years ago. Wow, that is amazing. Now you and your wife have been married for over 60 years. Is that right? 64 years. Wow. What? 64 years. What is your secret to a happy marriage? <laughs> oh. oh, well, have you ever heard the expression, happy wife, happy life? Yes. Well, that works. <laughs> that works. Well, there you go. So that's all you have to do. Keep your wife happy, right? Well, uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, remind us how this American boy born in Kentucky ended up pastoring in England. Well, it's because in England they were so desperate that they were willing to look anywhere, all, even to Kentucky. <laughs> I guess that's the reason, but the truthful answer, well, maybe that was the truthful answer. But uh, having finished seminary in Louisville, Kentucky, I uh, did well academically. They recommended me for Oxford. So I go to Oxford, England, and do a doctorate. They call it DPhil over there. It's a PhD anywhere else. And uh, I'm invited to preach at Westminster Chapel, and it's a one-off, except that they kept me, and I stayed 25 years. Wow. So you're part English now. Well, uh, (laughs) I uh, 
when I'm over there, I feel like an American. When I'm home, I feel like a Brit. <laughs> That's uh, kind of funny, huh? I understand that. And where do you live now? Nashville. Oh, okay. We have a lovely condo. And as I speak, I'm looking over the Nashville skyline. We have a beautiful, if anybody watches my uh, Twitter, uh, many of my uh, t- tweets are done with the Nashville background. Very nice. So you're even on social media. Yeah, yeah. My son comes here two or three times a week and records uh, tweets, which I normally get from my Bible reading from that day and speak for about 60 seconds. So I've been doing this for three or four years. That is such a blessing. Well, as I mentioned, I want to talk about your book, Fear, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Tell us why you wrote this book. Well, for years I've wanted to write a book on the fear of God. Uh, I feel, and I think you might agree with me, the fear of God has perished from the nation. And I would even say there's no fear of God to speak of in the church. And uh, I consider the book of Acts a great fear came upon the people. Uh, The fear of God is just diminished. Uh, So I wanted to write a book on the fear of God. And then one day I was reading that proverb on the fear of man is a snare. And I thought, well, what I should do is write a book on the fear of God versus the fear of man. And then a few weeks later, I was watching the movie, uh, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Yeah. And I thought, well, now that would be a good title of a book. Uh, with apologies to Clint Eastwood. <laughs> right. And I thought the fear of God is the good fear, fear of man is the bad fear, and demonic fear is the ugly fear. So I deal uh, with all three of these, as you probably know. I guess you've read it or looked at it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But that's, that's the background. That and well, and that those are three important things for believers to know. And I one thing I like about the book, it doesn't just identify these fears, but of course helps your reader to get out of them. How do you hope this book changes readers' lives? Well, uh, written during the time of COVID, many people scared to death, people afraid to die, uh, people fearing loneliness. And I think the fear of God is the answer. Uh, When people find out uh, who God is, what he's like, and does it mean that they are going to be afraid of him in the sense that they run uh, from him, thinking that he's going to kill them? On the other hand, there's a touch of that is needed. I, I've got to say, uh, there's no fear of God in the land today. They need a touch of that. But at the same time, the more you fear God, the more you love him. And the more you find out he loves you. And you find out how tender he is and and wonderful. So... Uh, But that begins with the fear of God. And Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of sin. And uh, when people are convicted of sin, they're aware that they have grieved a holy God and that the God of the Bible punishes sin. And the earliest message of the New Testament, the very first, people forget this, was John the Baptist, Matthew chapter 3, who has warned you to flee from the wrath to come. It's a message not being preached by anybody that I know of. Listeners, we're talking today with author, pastor, speaker, Dr. R.T. Kendall. We're going to take a little break, but when we come back, let's dig into this book, Fear, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. Stay tuned. We'll be back after this. I'm David Warren here with some exciting news for Oasis listeners. We have a new mobile device app. It's free, easy to download, and lets you enjoy our refreshing music and talk everywhere you go. If you have an Android cell phone, go to the Google Play Store. And if you have an iPhone or iPad, visit the Apple Store and search for Oasis Radio Network. Be an Oasis ambassador and share this news with family and friends around the world. Oasis Network. 
I'm glad you're listening to The Road Show today. I'm Karen Jensen Salisbury, your host, and we're talking today with the amazing, prolific R.T. Kendall. And we are talking about his one book today, Fear, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And as you mentioned, R.T., this is a kind of a takeoff on the the Clint Eastwood movie, which if you're old enough, you know (laughs) about the good, the bad, and the ugly. So it's about, one, the good, the fear of God, uh, the bad, which is the fear of man, and the ugly, which is satanic fear. You you mentioned a few things about the fear of God. Um, I know that um, you tell the story about, uh, well, you say in the very beginning, you say in the intro, you had a head start when it comes to the fear of the Lord. What was your head start? Well, I, I believe that to be true. Uh, I can't be sure why that is. I could start with this. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Cane Ridge Revival. Uh, that is known as America's Second Great Awakening, the first being the New England Awakening in the 18th century, and then in the uh, 19th century, right at the beginning, the beginning of the Cap Meetings was in Cane Ridge, Kentucky, uh, near Lexington. And uh, Ashland is 100 miles from there. And there was something about the Cane Ridge Revival that uh, revived the fear of God, which actually, you could say, was uh, very, very prominent in the, in the New England awakening. And so I think that the pastors I had as I grew up, I can remember the man that influenced me most. His name was Gene Phillips. Uh, when he would preach, there was a sense of the fear of God, and they would bring evangelists in. And in those days, people believed in hell, and uh, so I cut my teeth on that kind of teaching. And that's why I say, I think correctly, not a head start, because people today, uh, I don't think they're getting that as a head start. There may be exceptions, and I I certainly hope there is, but uh, that's why I say that. Yeah, and you even say Jesus had more to say about hell than heaven. He did. He did. Uh, You know, people will say, well, I believe in heaven, but I don't believe in hell. And my reply is, if there's no hell, there's no heaven. Yeah, yeah. And you tell the story in this first part of the book about a young woman named Patsy Branham. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tell us that story. You know what? Whenever I go back to Ashland, Kentucky, I make it a point. I'm always... And I take Louise by 25th and Montgomery Avenue because she's heard me tell it. I was going to say a thousand times. Well, not that often, but many times. Here's what happened. Um, in a revival meeting on a Sunday morning, the evangelist, his name was Dr. W. M. Tidwell from Chattanooga, Tennessee. And uh, I was, I would say, 15 years old, and he wanted to use me as a visible illustration. He was kind of an eccentric old man. He was 80 years old. I thought that was old. No, I'm 87. (laughs) I was 15, and he was preaching on the the parable of Jesus when they would bind them hand and foot and cast them to outer darkness. And at an appropriate time in the service, he had four men in the audience come and Uh, lift me up, tie my hands and feet uh, together. And they walked out the center aisle and took me out of the church building. And uh, it was an illustration that people will be carried into outer darkness against their will, but they won't be able to do anything about it, be bound hand and foot. Well, I was too young, I think, to know what was going on because I was kind of embarrassed as as a kid because people were snickering you know, this RT being carried out. But, but, I was told that a great sense of the fear of God came on the congregation. I was not aware of it. I've got to be honest. I I didn't sense that myself. But when the evangelist stood up to give the appeal, he said, somebody here is getting their last call. Mm -hmm. And... All I know is my mother, who happened to be seated very near this young lady, noticed 
that throughout the service she was irreverent and rude, and uh, she actually wondered when the man said the evangelist said that somebody's getting the last call. She actually wondered if it would be Patsy. Uh, well, he wouldn't dismiss the service. He turned it over to the pastor. Said, "I'm not going to dismiss. Somebody is getting their last call." Well, that's you know sort of a sensational thing to say. But that's what he said, and the pastor said, well, I'm not going to dismiss the church either. And people slowly just got up and walked out and went home. Well, the next day, I was uh, delivering newspapers. I had a little job with the, uh, giving out the Ashland Daily Independent. And I never will forget, I remember it as though it were yesterday. When I finished my paper route, my mother was out on the porch and said, R.T., have you heard about Patsy? I said, what do you mean? She said she was just killed. She was oh. just killed as she was walking home toward Montgomery Ave- on Montgomery Avenue and 25th Street. A car careened up on the sidewalk and killed her instantly. Oh, my. Oh, well, we all went to the church that night because everybody just wanted to go to the church. And everyone was talking about it. And they remembered. In fact, as I... <laughs> Forgive me, I, I, I cannot tell the story without coming to tears. I remember it so it was yesterday, and the place that filled up again on a Monday night, and people, re- they remember that. Well, uh, that's, that's the story. Yeah. And it had an effect on me that I have, as you can tell now, I, I, I can't get over it yet. So I, I grew up believing things like that. And it's affected me as a minister all my life. Yeah, it's sobering, isn't it? I'll tell you one other thing. Over the years, I thought, you know, Patsy was only, as far as I know, she was 16, maybe 17 years old. We're living in a time when young people don't go to church. And you might think that would cause all the young people in Nazarene Church in Ashton, Kentucky, to stop going to church. They came more than ever. Yeah. And and this is the thing that I think needs to be stressed. Uh, preaching the fear of God is not going to run people off. This is why they're running away now. Preaching the love of God and smooth things. It's not building up the church. They, they don't even bother to go to church. I think if there were a return to the preaching of the fear of God, I honestly believe it would fill churches again. That is, if they could preach that with the anointing. Yeah, you say in chapter two, which is called the origin of fear, you say that the fear of God is productive. It leads to peace and true knowledge and wisdom. Sure, that's what the Bible teaches. And uh, when you understand the true God, uh, he, he does things to get your attention. But then when he gets your attention, you find out he's a loving and merciful God. Yes, he's trying to help. Yes. Yes, and in chapter two, Three, which is called understanding the fear of the Lord, you say there are basically two ways that one comes to understand the fear of the Lord, either taught or caught. Yes. Well, uh, uh, there's a psalm that says, come to me and I'll teach you the fear of the Lord. It can be taught, and uh, I don't know that it's being done today. I don't mean to be unfair, uh, but uh, the reason I wrote the book is because I think there's an absence of fear of God. What I mean by caught, well, I refer to myself. I just grew up. It it caught uh, the kind of preaching that uh, I heard. And then I've been influenced uh, largely by the sermon that Jonathan Edwards preached, July the 8th, 1741. Do you know what? My wife and I have driven four times to Enfield, Connecticut. It's right on the borderline of Massachusetts and Connecticut, about six miles from the border. And you go into Enfield, there's a certain vacant lot. It's across the street from the Montessori School. A vacant lot and a big stone embedded into the ground where you have the writing. On this site, uh, July 8, 1741, Jonathan Edwards preached his sermon, 
sinners in the hands of an angry God during the New England Awakening. Mm. Well, I've known about it. When he finished preaching, people were holding on to church pews, literally, to keep from sliding into hell. Men were seeing outside the church, hanging on to tree trunks to keep from sliding into hell. So great was the power of God on that sermon. You know, news of that sermon went all over New England in days. It crossed the Atlantic. It was into England in weeks. And to this day, it's the high watermark of the Great Awakening. And uh, when uh, it led to the most amazing number of people converted at at the end of the day, uh, between 1725 and 1760, uh, that's the New England Awakening. It it lasted several uh, uh, years, but the high watermark was the day Jonathan Edwards preached that sermon. And so the reason we drive there, I only stay 10 minutes, 15. I Sometimes I stand, sometimes I get on my knees with one prayer, one prayer. Lord, do it again. This is what America needs. And in my opinion, the only thing that will change anything in America is a return to the fear of God. Excellent. Well, let's take a break. Stay with us. The Roadshow is a listener favorite, which airs each weekday here on the Oasis Radio Network, starting at 1 p.m. Eastern, 12 noon Central. The Roadshow also has a great section on our website, oasisnetwork.org. There you'll find audio archives of select past interviews, plus guest lineup and contact information, and links to our Roadshow sponsors and its host. So join us for The Roadshow, whether on your radio, computer, or mobile device at oasisnetwork.org. It's a great day on The Roadshow. I'm your host, Karen Jensen Salisbury, and our very special guest today is author, pastor, teacher, Dr. R.T. Kendall. We're talking about his book, Fear, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. So it's divided into those three sections, and we covered the good, which is the fear of the Lord. So now, R.T., let's look at the second one, the bad, which is the fear of man. Yes. You know, it's, it's, it's bad that you actually let people's opinions govern you. And this is the reason the Jews missed their Messiah 2,000 years ago. Uh, Jesus knew that the Pharisees didn't accept him, and so he put it to them, how can you believe? It's a question. How can you believe who receive honor one of another and make no attempt to seek the honor that comes from God only, or the only God. And you would have thought the Pharisees, who know the God of the Old Testament, uh, would understand that he's a God of glory, and he wants to be glorified by our words and our choices. But the Pharisees uh, had so uh, forgotten the true God that they were only governed by what people thought and what each other thought. They didn't want to be put out of the synagogue if they praised Jesus. And Jesus said to them, surprise, surprise, you don't believe because you don't bother to want the honor of God because if you did, you'd know who I am. But because you don't, you've missed it. And so it was the fear of man that caused the Jews to miss their Messiah. And I say it's the fear of man to this very day that will cause people to miss what God is in because they are so afraid of what people will think if they endorse this or that movement and so forth. Yeah, yeah. One of the things you say is backsliding begins in the knees. Tell us what you mean by that. Well, uh, you used the uh, the expression earlier in the program about how I uh, had a head start. Uh, understanding the fear of God, well, I would say I had a head start when it comes to prayer. I had a godly father who spent a half hour on his knees. He never prayed sitting down. He always knelt. And uh, I grew up seeing that. And so when I was a teenager, 15, 16, 17 years old, I would pray the equivalent of a half hour a day, 
15 minutes in the morning before I go to school, 15 minutes before I go to bed. And you know what? I thought everybody did that. <laughs> Until years later, I become the pastor of a church, and I find out nobody does. Yeah. People just don't pray. And it's worse than ever. Uh, you know, a major magazine took a poll some years ago on how much do preachers pray. And they took a poll uh, that was answered by pastors, evangelists, bishops, priests, all denominations. And one of the questions is, how much do you pray? How much do you pray? Quiet time. And uh, uh, before I give you the results of the survey, uh, listen to these words from Martin Luther's journal. He said, I have a very busy day today, must not spend two hours, but three in prayer. Wow. That's, John, that's Martin Luther. John Wesley spent two hours every day on his knees before he went out into the day. The average church leader today spends four minutes a day in quiet time. And you wonder why the church is asleep and why people have no fear of God. And it's the fear of man because we're afraid of what people will think. And if we sought the honor of God, we get away from the fear of man. And you list several reasons that the fear of man is a snare uh, and, and several temptations like protecting your reputation and money. Tell us about some of those. Well, yeah. uh, listen, here's a story that comes out of uh, the Welsh Revival. Uh, the Welsh Revival, 1904 and 1905, 25,000 people were converted in Wales in 16 in, in just uh, six months. Uh, there was a missionary couple in India who heard about the Welsh Revival. And so they decided to leave their mission, and they took a, a boat, landed at Southampton in England, and then uh, came up to London, and they were going to go to Wales to see the Welsh Revival. They ran into some old friends. They said, what are you doing in England? We thought you were in India. Oh, said the couple, we were going back to India. Don't worry about that. But we've come to see the Welsh Revival. This couple said to them, don't bother. It's Welsh emotionalism. And the couple the missionary couple said, oh, well, we didn't know. Thanks for telling us. They got on a boat in Southampton and went back to India and didn't even bother to go to see what was going on in Wales because they took the word of this couple, who I would say probably backslidden Christians. I don't know for sure. But isn't that a pity? They come all the way from India to see the Welsh Revival, take the word of somebody who says it's not of God, and they go back. They didn't want to offend their friends. They could have said, well, we're going to go to Wales anyway since yeah. we've come this far. They didn't even do that. They went back. It's an example of how we do things out of the fear of man. Yeah. You mentioned that you struggled with the fear of man yourself, but then you invited Arthur Blessed. <laughs> well, Yeah. Uh, I had an opportunity to have him preach for us. It's, I don't think you want the details. It's not going to take a long time. But I've written about it in many of my books. Uh, another book I'm writing, by the way, don't think I'm getting off the subject because I'm not. I'm writing a book now called Finest Hour, and I'm dealing with what was each major Bible person uh, like David, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, what was their finest hour? And then people ask me, what was my finest hour? And it's when I invited Arthur Blessed to Westminster Chapel. But I had to overcome the fear of man to do that because Arthur was so different. And I don't know if you know much about the English. Uh, the English are the most traditional people in the world. Yeah. Uh, Westminster Chapel was the most traditional church in England. And then I invite Arthur Blessed 
who doesn't wear a suit. Well, churches today, nobody does. But <laughs> in those days, he wore a suit. And Arthur preached in jeans and, and an open neck collar. And he offended people. And I had people leave. And six of my deacons turned against me. And I had to stick to my guns. Or we would have just uh, tried to please people. And in my opinion, Westminster Chapel would have gone down to nothing if I had been motivated by the fear of man. But I stuck to my guns. We kept Arthur. He preached for us for six weeks in a row. And then when he left, I kept up doing things that he started that Westminster Chapel has never done before, like singing choruses. I uh, gave an invitation at the end of my sermons. Uh, that had not been done before. And the big thing, we got out on the streets and witnessing yeah. to the lost. Uh, we called ourselves pilot lights. And uh, this is this is, it turned Westminster Chapel upside down. But if I had been motivated by the fear of man, oh, we would never have done anything like that. But it was my finest hour, in my opinion. I've never regretted it. And I thank God again and again and again that I invited Arthur Blessed. And had the courage to stand up to the fear of man. Yes, and well, that's what you talk about in Chapter 6. Thankfully, you don't leave us hanging, but you talk about how to overcome fear of man. Maybe there's someone listening today who is, you know, they might recognize some things about themselves as they're listening to you and think, gosh, I might have fear of man. What would you tell them? Well, first of all, you're motivated by people that you don't even know. You you imagine uh, the straw man out there. Yeah. What will they think? And they may not even know about it, but you think they do. Or you're motivated by an enemy who's going to criticize you. Or you're motivated by a friend who will say, don't do that. It's like the missionary couple I just talked about. Right. Well, you've got to realize how silly it is to let what people might or might not think make you do something that you're going to regret it one time. I promise you, anybody listening, if you are motivated by the fear of a person, what you think they will think, you will live to regret it. And the only remedy, in my opinion, is to be gripped by John 5, 44, Jesus' words. How can you believe who receive honor one of another and do not bother to Seek the honor that comes from the only God. When you are motivated to want to please God, when that grips you, when that matters more than anything in the world, you will see how ridiculous it is to be motivated by the fear of man, and it'll go away because you want to please God. I I notice you also mentioned uh, in the book learning to eschew compliments. Well, yeah, learning. It's not easy. Yeah. Uh, I don't think anybody ever, ever outgrows uh, enjoying a compliment. Sure. Like if when we finish this broadcast right now, if you say to me, RT, thank you. I enjoyed that. I like to hear that. Sure. So I don't want to give the impression that we hate compliments because we don't. But what I do teach get to the place that you don't do things for compliments. Mm. You do it to say, God, what did you think? Did I please you? And wanting to please God is the way to get over letting compliments motivate you. Yeah, yeah. One of the things I love about your books is that they include so many personal stories and examples that make it easy for us to understand. Well, now see there, you just complimented me. (laughs) Am I going? If, if I'm going to say to you, shame on you! Don't do that. Right. I'm not going to do that. Of course, no. I like it. I don't want to give the impression that we become exempt from liking a compliment. I mean, I followed, as you may know, the, the great Martin Lloyd Jones, arguably the greatest preacher of all time, at least since Spurgeon's day. I can tell you for a fact, he loved a compliment after he got through preaching. He loved him. We we never outgrow that, right? But we must not let what they may think keep us from doing what God wants us to do. Yep, 
Listeners, we're talking with Dr. R.T. Kendall about his book, Fear, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Um, R.T., remind us where we can get the book again. Oh, well, uh, not many bookstores anymore. You can always order it through a bookstore or uh, rtkendallministries.com. Uh, we can send you a copy. I'm not trying to sell my book. <laughs> what but, else will we find on your website? What else do you find on my website? Well, my schedule, uh, the books I've written, over 80, uh, and we can get them to you if you want them. Or you can go to Amazon.com and get any book. Uh, so I'm happy for you to buy it that way. Happy for you to buy my book. Hope uh, books. I hope they'll be a blessing to you. Well, we've covered the good, the fear of God, the bad, the fear of man. Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to dig into the ugly, which is satanic fear. Don't touch that dial. I'm David Warren, Program Director at Oasis Radio Network and one of the hosts of this podcast. All of our hosts enjoy hearing from you, our listening family, so drop us a note. Our email address is roadshow at oasisnetwork.org. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast and you'll receive new episodes on your mobile devices. And now, back to the show. Here on The Roadshow today, we've been talking with Dr. R.T. Kendall about his book, Fear, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. I'm your host, Karen Jensen Salisbury. R.T., thanks again for being with us today. Thank you. Um, you know, you say in the preface of your book, I would like to think that the devil is unhappy with all my books, but I can assure you that he will not like this one, especially the third section. So here we are in the third section talking about satanic fear. So talk to us a little bit about that. Well, the devil wants to bluff. Uh, he's a roaring lion. A lion bluffs and gets another animal scared to death and think he's finished. Uh, the devil comes two ways, as a roaring lion, also as an angel of light. And uh, the Apostle Paul said of the devil, we are not uh, ignorant of his devices. We know his ways, and we need to know. And uh, But my view is that, and, and you've uh, interviewed me on the book about uh, Famous in Hell, Right. Well, it's it's that comes into this particular segment. Uh, we are aware that we can make the devil angry. That would be a compliment if he's in any way threatened by us. But on the other hand, uh, what you have in my book about satanic fear is that people forget uh, that the devil is real and. Uh, uh, demon possession is a no joke thing, and uh, uh, when you are motivated by the devil, uh, you've it's it's a very sad moment. And so I deal in the book with demon possession, the difference between oppression and possession, and uh, how uh, the devil just wants to keep us afraid. Uh, the Apostle Paul said to Timothy. God has not given us a spirit of fear. He's not talking now about the fear of God when he says that. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. Uh, but people are naturally afraid, and the devil will play into that. And if he sees you as a person of fear, uh, he will do anything he can to make you more afraid. And uh, so that's uh, the idea of the worst kind of fear it's when the devil gets involved and and uh, will do anything he can to destroy you, bring you to misery, and uh, uh, we need to, to be aware of his ways. And thankfully, in chapter 8, which is called the evil day, you tell us what to do when Satan attacks and how to stand. Well, uh, the Apostle Paul deals with that in Ephesians chapter 6, and he reminds us that uh, our... Uh, conflict is not against people. Now, it can be, sure. but there is a major power behind that, and we need to understand that. I personally start every day with praying for the blood of Jesus to cover me. I end 
every day with the blood of Jesus to cover me. Why? Because we know the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus is what gives us access to the Father. And we know in Revelation chapter 12, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. And uh, Satan hates the blood of Jesus. And when we are covered by the blood, he cannot get to us. And uh, so I uh, believe strongly in praying daily for the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. Uh, when I start praying, I pray for this. I pray when I'm writing a book that I'll be governed by the fear of God and Satan will not be able to interfere with me. And uh, God has been very good to me. Uh, we, to, if I could use an expression that you brought up, you know, I've done it twice about having a head start. I was named after my father's favorite preacher. Um, we were brought up in the Church of the Nazarene. And my father's favorite preacher was Dr. R.T. Williams. And that's why I go by R.T. His name was Roy. My name is Robert Tillman. And I've always been R.T. R.T. Williams, when he would ordain people to the ministry, he would give these instructions. Honor the blood and honor the Holy Ghost. Well, that's word and spirit. That's my DNA. That's what I do. Uh, preaching the word and, and emphasis on the spirit equally. And uh, and the fact that I was brought up to hear that kind of language, honor the blood and honor the Holy Spirit, doesn't mean the devil was not going to fight us. But when we know we're covered by the blood of Jesus and we operate under the strength of the Holy Spirit, uh, the devil can go so far, but only so far, and he cannot have a victory over us. I want to be sure we get to chapter 10, which is called The Way Forward, where you start out by saying the best weapon in spiritual warfare is total forgiveness. Yes, that's absolutely true. You see, the devil is looking for an entry point into every person's life. And if he can sense, and he, he, he knows what's going on in us. He's got a computer printout on every one of us. And he knows our weakness. Yeah. And when he can sense that we've got bitterness, when he sense that we've got unforgiveness, he will play into that. As a matter of fact, you read 2 Corinthians chapter 2, in the same place where Paul said we're not ignorant of his devices, he says we have forgiven in order that the devil will not get the advantage of us. So if you have totally forgiven... The devil can't get to you. But if there's bitterness there, he can get to you. And so a, a good reason for total forgiveness is not only that you'll have an increase of the presence of God, but you will be able to uh, withstand the devil because you don't have bitterness in you and you've forgiven everybody. And as you probably know that uh, in my book, Total Forgiveness, uh, you ask earlier, what is my favorite book? I don't say that Total Forgiveness is my favorite, but it's my best seller. I will say that. Ah. And that all came about because when I was in the darkest hour, Louise and I, darkest hour of our lives, and I was bitter and angry over what had happened. I was betrayed. And uh, an old friend, his name is Joseph Tsun, uh, he now lives in Oregon, but at that time he was from Romania and happened to be in London. And I told him what happened to me because I thought, well, I can't tell anybody else, but Joseph won't tell anybody. And he will put his arm around me and say, RT, you ought to be angry. He looked at me and words that changed my life forever RT, you must totally forgive them. Mm. I can hear him now. You can totally forgive them <laughs> until you totally forgive them. You will be in chains. Release them and you will be released. No one had ever talked to me like that in my life. Faithful of the wounds of a friend and uh, changed my life. And it's good that uh, that you have brought this up toward the end because this is what I think everybody needs. 
And you can defeat the devil, not just by the blood of Jesus, but by forgiving anybody, whatever it is they've done. Yes, that's so powerful. So powerful. So in this chapter, The Way Forward, you sum up four steps and you've kind of alluded to them, but let's just say them again for someone who's struggling maybe with fear or with bitterness. First, you say, pray daily for the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus. Yep. And second... I've just talked about that. So yep. go to the next one. And second, you know who your real enemy is. I think you talked That's about the that. the devil, yeah. Yep. yeah. Don't blame the people. Remember the devil is your real enemy. Yep, go on. Third is dignify every trial. Yes. Now, we haven't covered that. Right. Uh, for many years, I'm ashamed to say that whenever there was a trial, I would just complain, murmur, grumble. Until one day when I was preaching through James, and verse 2 says, Count it pure joy when you fall into all kinds of trials. And I came up with this expression, dignify the trial. All trials will end. Stop grumbling. And when it's over, God will give you a pass or fail. And for years, I would get an F, failing, because I griped the whole time. Now, what's the fourth? A total forgiveness, which we just hit on. Okay. And you end with a quote from Rick Warren that says, every time you forgive, you disappoint the devil. Yeah, that's good. That's a great statement. That is. Can't take let's, credit for it. That's Rick Warren. Let's good keep for him. doing that. Yes, amen. Well, listeners, we've been talking today with Dr. R.T. Kendall. And you can get his book, uh, Fear, the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, on his website, rtkendallministries.com. As we close today, R.T., would you pray for our listeners? Sure, sure. Well, th- thank you for having me. Oh, thanks for well, being Heavenly with us. Father, thank you for the privilege of being on this program. And I pray that what I have said will honor you and make a difference in the lives of those who've heard it. I pray for anyone who, as I speak and as I talk to you, is in their greatest trial. Give them the spirit to dignify the trial, to realize the trial will end and all heaven is watching to see if we will dignify the trial and disappoint the devil because we honor God in it. So I pray for the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus upon every person listening. Bless them, protect them, supply their every need, guide them by your Holy Spirit. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. R.T., thanks so much for being on the Roadshow today. Privilege, thank you. Listeners, thank you for being with us today. On behalf of the Oasis Network, I'm Karen Jensen Salisbury with my very special guest, Dr. R.T. Kendall, saying God bless you. Thanks for listening. It's been another great road show. You've been listening to The Road Show. If you'd like to write to us, here's our address. The Road Show, P.O. Box 1924, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 74101. Our email address is roadshow at oasisnetwork.org. The views of today's guest aren't necessarily those of this station, but we do appreciate and thank our guest for spending this time with us. The Roadshow, an Oasis Network presentation.